Now, that had great, great influence. It had great, should I say, effect upon the whole kingdom, and we'll talk about that later on. What great effect? If the Byzantine reconquest of Italy and the installation of Vigilius had any effect on the papacy, it was surely a negative one. Every historian I have read on the subject considers the period of Justinian's reclamation to represent one of the lowest periods in papal history, and this was entirely due to renewed imperial interference in papal affairs. Philip Schaff, who Ken quoted a few minutes ago, stated that the reigns of Vigilius and Pelagius I revealed how much the power of the Roman hierarchy was indebted to its remoteness from the Byzantine despotism and how much it was injured by contact with it. Regarding Vigilius, his reign would lead to schism and broken communion among churches throughout northern Africa, northern Italy, and Gaul, and the power and prestige of the papacy would lie in ruin as a result. According to George Park Fisher, it was the Lombard invasion in 568 AD which saved the future of the papacy by breaking Byzantine control over the peninsula, which led to the 8th century papacy obtaining Frankish aid instead of Byzantine aid against the Lombards, which led to the donation of Pepin and the autonomous papal kingdom that resulted from it. Had Justinian's successors managed to keep a firm grip on Italy, none of the events I just mentioned would have happened, and the history of the medieval papacy would have followed an entirely different path. So, no, Belisarius placing Vigilius on the papal throne did not have great influence upon the whole kingdom, or on the future of the papacy. Without the collapse of Byzantine authority in Italy in the centuries that followed, the Bishop of Rome would have been no better off than the Patriarch of Constantinople. Ken's attempt to talk about the effect of Vigilius's pontificate will be discussed next. He shall be different from the first. Now, I told you, Justinian felt that he couldn't control his kingdom any longer politically, so he thought maybe he could control it religiously. So with Virgilius taking the seat of the bishop and working under Justinian, all of a sudden you find the kingdom changing and you find union of church and state. No longer is it just a political power. It is a religio-political power. Church and state has come together. That's why the scripture says it is different different than it has been. I guess Ken might not be aware of this, but the Roman Empire had been a Christian religio-political power by the end of the 4th century AD. At the time of Justinian, bishops throughout the empire had worked under emperors and other civil authorities for well over 200 years. In 380 AD, the Emperor Theodosius I declared that all nations governed by the empire would practice that religion which was carried by the divine Peter to the Roman people, and all who refused to accept the law would be punished first by divine vengeance, and secondly by the exertion of our power which we have received by divine favor. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like the union of church and state to me and for good reason. So, Vigilius working under direct imperial rule simply put him back on the same religio-political footing that the popes experienced prior to 476 AD. This is from the history book called The Rise of the Medieval Church by Alexander Fleck. And uh, listen carefully, a very, very important statement in history. This tells you what happened. The Bishop of Rome in the seat of Caesar. Now, folks, let me, let me explain something. Justinian, when he put Virgilius on the seat of the bishop, he never intended Virgilius to be anything other than the docile head of the Department of Religion. That's all he intended for him to be. But history says that the Bishop of Rome sees the, se the scepter and step to the seat of Caesar. And this is what says happened. Watch. The Bishop of Rome, now in the seat of Caesar, was now the greatest man in the West, and was soon, and I want you to listen to this word, and was soon what? 
forced. You need to be that, keep that very clear. This wasn't something that he just intended to do. It was forced upon him, was forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. All of a sudden, he found himself not just the head of the church, he finds himself the head of the government. The problem with Ken's claim is simple. He takes the Alexander Flick reference and tries to tell us that Vigilius was forced to take Caesar's seat and became the greatest man in the West sometime after 538 AD. But in reality, Flick was actually describing the state of the papacy beginning in the 4th century, immediately after Constantine moved the capital to the east. You would not know this based on Ken's very selective use of Flick's material, so allow me to provide additional context. On page 168, Flick says, The removal of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330 left the Western Church practically free from imperial power to develop its own form of organization. The Bishop of Rome, in the seat of the Caesars, was now the greatest man in the West, and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. See how important that preceding sentence was? So Flick believed it was in 330 AD that the Bishop of Rome sat in the seat of the Caesars and was the greatest man in the West. He was not describing Vigilius's reign. The part about the bishop soon forced to become the political head could apply to the post-Justinian era, but it could just as easily refer to Rome in the 4th century during the absence of the Western emperors. Unfortunately, Flick never clarified this in his book. Now, if Ken was truly interested in Flick's view of the papacy at the time of Vigilius, he should have skipped to pages 296 and 297. After giving a number of examples of Byzantine encroachment on papal matters, he says, This arbitrary interference with the affairs of the Western Church by the imperial authority at Constantinople brought the papal hierarchy to the brink of ruin. Flick goes on to say that the papacy would begin to reassert its universal primacy after the Roman clergy consecrated Pope Pelagius II, almost 40 years after Vigilius became pope. Of course, the clergy's independence and the papacy's assertiveness was due to the emperor's weakened position in Italy after the Lombard invasion, something I have mentioned previously. Flick confirms that the barbarian invasions on the whole strengthened both the spiritual and temporal supremacy of the Holy See, and the Lombard invasion certainly created conditions that led to temporal power and the rise of the medieval papacy. Vigilius ascending the papal chair? Mm, not so much. On page 299, Flick also attributes growing strength to the papacy between 552 and 800 AD, 552 being the year the fate of the Ostrogothic War was effectively decided at the Battle of Busta Galorum. The year 538 AD, not even mentioned by Flick. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital, hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride, sense of glory, and every social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city in the ecclesiastical capital. So all of a sudden you find the power that had been in the state, all of a sudden now the religious head has. And so you find union of church and state taking place. It's a different power that it has been, than it has been before. No. It was not a different power, at least not by the time of Pope Vigilius. Flick was describing his view of the papacy and Rome's evolution in the 4th century AD. If Ken truly believes what Flick was saying, then he would have to recognize that the union of church and state took place over 200 years before the reign of Pope Vigilius. Civil as well as religious disputes were referred to the successor of Peter, for settlement. Thus, it changes. Right, it changed. But Flick says the change took place in the 4th century. Certain civil disputes and religious disputes were referred to the Roman bishops after Constantine moved the seat of the Roman Empire in 330 AD. On page 178, Flick writes, The civil government naturally approved a system of church polity which was in harmony with that of the state. And on page 167, he says, In 378, Emperor Gratian added civic sanction to the judicial authority of the Bishop of Rome by compelling accused bishops to go to Rome for trial. 
Ultimate appellate jurisdiction was definitely assigned to the Pope by Emperor Valentinian III in 445 when, of his own motion, causes could be called to Rome for papal decision. And on pages 178 and 179, Flick writes, In fact, there was a sentiment in the Church that it was much better to carry on all business with the imperial authorities through him, the Pope. The Council of Sardica in 347 decreed that all prelates visiting Rome for the purpose of obtaining civic favors should present their petitions through the Bishop of Rome. These are examples of the union of church and state existing long before 538 A.D., and they are right there in Flick's book. Professor of History, University of Rome, Ablenka, and this is what he says, to the succession of the Caesars, that's pagan Rome, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. So he's saying that this passed from the Caesars to the pontiffs, all right? When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. That's exactly what history has to say about it. Who in the world is La Blanca? Does this mystery professor have a first name? Does the quote come from a book? And the University of Rome? Well, which one? There are a number of Roman universities. I'm sorry, but there are far too many unanswered questions surrounding this source. I haven't found any examples of it existing outside of Adventist websites or prophecy seminars, and I've even seen some examples of the same quote in which the name is spelled La Bianca, so it seems like even the last name is suspect. And of course, in every instance, it's always Professor of History, University of Rome. No book title or page numbers offered. There are just far too many red flags to make this a reliable source in my opinion. As far as the content of the quote is concerned, it seems to coincide with Alexander Flick's opinion that the emperor's departure in 330 AD caused the pope to sit in the seat of the Caesars. But keep in mind, Flick placed this event some 200 years before the ascension of Pope Vigilius. One can only hope Mr. LeBlanca does as well. Prophetic faith of our fathers, Leroy Froome, this is what he has to say. In 537, Silverus, I talked about him Wednesday night, that was the Bishop of Rome, godly man, was banished by Belsarius, and the deacon, Vigilus, was elected Pope. So you find that one went down, Silverus did, and Justinian, who was the emperor, put, so, put Vigilus in his place. As I've mentioned before, it was Theodora, not Justinian, who replaced Silverius with Vigilius. It might be helpful to know that while the disgraced pope was exiled to Patera in 537 AD, the city's bishop traveled to Constantinople to plead Silverius' case before the court of Justinian. The emperor was moved by the bishop's words, and he ordered Silverius to return to Rome for a retrial. I'm sorry, but this doesn't sound at all like the course of action Justinian would take if he had orchestrated Silverius' deposition in the first place. And that's because he didn't. <laughs> 